For now, we have our, our International Sunday, all right? February 18th, so please get registered. If you want to bring a uh, potluck from your nationality, please sign up. should be an awesome time. And, uh, yes, yeah, so we're looking forward to that. Amen? Um, let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And, uh, you know, I, I'm very grateful that we're, we're looking at Jesus and his life. Um, we're going to continue our study on the gospel here and how Jesus and his gospel, his story, is the bridge from God to man. And he is the bridge that essentially reaches the world. He's the one that saves the world. And um, very similar to however, you know, you can look at the Super Bowl however you want to. It's a big deal, right, for much of our country now. And, um, there's, there's one sense it's something you anticipate. And here we see that there's, Jesus arrives, right? There's an anticipation for Jesus. But in John 2, we see him arriving. We see him living up to the anticipation of who he was at two major Jewish events. One is a Jewish wedding. And then another is the Jewish Passover, both a big deal in Jewish culture. And this is the first time Jesus appears on the scene. So the title of our sermon this morning is The Arrival of Light. What does it look like when the light arrives? And these are two, like I said, big pieces of Jewish culture. Let's see how Jew, uh, Jesus arrives and makes his presence felt at these two events. John chapter 2, verse 1, I'm going to say a quick prayer. God, thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity to dive in your word. Pray, Father, Holy, uh, just that use your Holy Spirit to minister to us this morning, um, to help us grow in our faith, to help us grow in our convictions, Lord, so that we can reach the world for you, Lord. You want to help people, God, change their lives the way our lives have been changed, God. You have been so good to us. You have nurtured our faith. You have strengthened our faith. We want to see that faith pass on to others, God. We want to see others make the same decisions of faith and commitment that we have made because you are worth it, Jesus. Your life is worth it, your death is worth it, your resurrection is worth it, your memory is worth it. We pray that you give us the strength and the faith from your word to preach it and share it so that others can live it as a result of the faith you've given us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. John chapter 2, verse 1 says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which uh, he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. We have two points from this story this morning, from this passage. First one is the light. When the light, when the light arrives, we see that the light cares. The light cares. And we see that John's first presentation of Jesus doing ministry First of all, I think it's cool. It's at a wedding. Let's me know what kind of God Jesus is and that he's a God who wants to enjoy life. He wants to have fun. He wants to be with people. He wants to celebrate. He wants to laugh. He wants to hug. He wants to dance. Hopefully, if you're visiting this morning, someone you don't know has already hugged you. As weird as that could be, because first time I went to church, I was like, why is everybody hugging? I understand. I don't hug anybody. This is weird. It's perfectly normal with this group, however, because when we're locked into Jesus, we remember that this is who Jesus was. Jesus loved people. Jesus cares deeply about people, that so much so that he doesn't let his plans and his agendas get in the way of still having fun and being family. 
the wedding in ancient culture was one of the highlights of the Jewish community. In a, this was a family-centric culture. And so weddings were an excuse for the family to just essentially party and celebrate for days on end. It was not uncommon for a, a Jewish wedding reception to be three days to seven days long. This is a big deal for them. Jesus, we see here, was not too busy to just enjoy life and have a good time with his family, with his friends. And then not only did he have a good time, he let his disciples have a good time and just be. The light has arrived and the light cares about us as people. The light wants the life that the light gives to be fun. Christianity, above all else, should be fun. Now, should it be challenging? Yes, but it should also make us laugh. It should also remind us that life is good. The light of Jesus isn't so busy that the light just can't be. That's Jesus. So the light cares, but here's the thing. The light cares, but that doesn't mean we'll always be comfortable. In this wedding, which was a good time, we see a problem arise. The wine was running out. Now, in this culture, if the wine ever ran out at any wedding, the groom and his family that was hosting the wedding would now be forever marked in their community as essentially incompetent people. Like, that was the family that ran out of wine at the wedding. That says something about that family. We do not associate with them. We shun them. And one says they're shamed for that. Because in a, in a culture of hospitality, it meant oh, they didn't think about the people. They didn't think about their guests. Can you imagine just making this mistake, and then you're marked, your family's marked, your wedding is marked for the rest of time? That would be, that would be so sad. And what I love about Jesus, he does not prevent their need for him, but he is present in their need for him. He doesn't prevent our need for him, but he is present in our need for him. The wine was still running out. There was still a need. But in that need, Jesus was there. Not only was he there, he wasn't just like, oh, that's a bummer. What are we going to do about it? He actually cares about the situation. Jesus cares about our needs. He cares about what we're going through. He cares about our trials. I, I think, you know, this passage is a constant reminder that at some point, however, we will all run out of wine. We will all need Jesus. At some point, we're going to have to admit to ourselves and others around us, you know what? I've ran out of wine. I don't have enough. I don't measure up. I am a messed up person. I do make mistakes. I do do dumb things. It's possible for me to sin. I hurt people. I hurt people I love. I couldn't afford enough wine for my son's wedding. But Jesus goes, I hear all that. And guess what? I know. And I care. And if you just admit that you need help, I will help you. Similar to these folks hosting a wedding, there's... There's a shame I think we try to avoid in knowing that we aren't enough and people knowing we aren't enough. That we, we, try, to, we try to avoid this feeling, this, this realization to ourselves and others that, you know what, we ran out of what people expect of us. Like, man, I don't got it. I don't have what it takes. I messed up. I sinned. And that shame is what prevents us from just being honest about who we are. Not just with others, but even with ourselves. And especially, we try to do this with God. We try to lie to ourselves and we try to lie to God because of the shame of just owning that, you know what, I ran out of wine. I'm not enough. So the, the tape we run instead is we just work harder to act like we have it all together spiritually that we have it all together financially, that we have it all together emotionally. And so we don't ask people to pray for us. 
And if we do, it's a very broad and generic prayer request. And it has nothing to do with our character changing. We don't ask advice from others because that would communicate to us and to the other party that we ran out of whatever it is we think we're still supposed to have. The whole time, Jesus is there, and he's like, you want me to do the miracle for you or not? I'm here, and I care. You think, like, Jesus, it's just a wedding. Why are you even at this wedding? Don't you have more important things to do? He's like, I'm here. My mom said there's a problem. It's not even my time to reveal myself. I love that. And Mary's like, hey, Jesus, hey, hey, hey. They run out of wine, man. You know what that means? And Jesus goes, I, look, I, look, it's, <laughs> if I start doing this stuff, there's going to be a lot of problems. This is a little premature for me to start revealing who I am. But you know what? I know what this means for these people if I don't intercede. I care about them. So therefore, tell them to bring the jars. Let's fill them up. Jesus cared. He cares about the shame we carry so we don't own things because of it. And he cares about us. He cares about us letting go of that shame. He already knows. He cares. And he's ready to help. He's ready to do a miracle, not just in our lives, but also in our hearts. Are we ready to let Jesus help us? Are we ready to read the Bible, not just to seem more spiritual, but to let the word change who we are? Are we ready to pray and ask others to pray for us? Not because we have it all together, but because we admit we don't. That we don't have it all together as married people. We don't have it all together as single people. We don't have it all together as parents or grandparents or uncles or aunts or siblings or friends. We're bad friends. Yeah, are we ready to let them, let Jesus help us be better? I believe if we trust that Jesus wants to help, we won't just see a miracle. We'll get to be a part of one. Amen? And that's the second point from this passage is that the light cares, but the light is contagious. The light is contagious. One of the commentaries I read in this passage, it made a great point. Jesus could have turned the water into wine without involving anybody else. Fair? Yeah. He didn't have to involve anybody. And no one would have known. But Jesus decides to involve these servants who really would have gone into eternity without anyone ever knowing about it. And he gives them significance. He gives them a purpose. He gives them a memory in eternity that we read about till the next Bible in Revelation. And he gives them a purpose by asking them to fill these jars with water, which you can imagine, it would have been so confusing at first. Like, Jesus, this is, like, what? First of all, who are you? Like, I heard you're preaching, but why am I filling this with water? And then these are 20 to 30 gallon jugs. You can imagine they're thinking, that's a lot of water. And you're thinking, this is pointless. Why am I doing this? Now i got to carry this heavy thing of water. Maybe it's me and somebody else. And you can just imagine just the confusion going on. By the end of it, however, these guys would have realized they just took part in a miracle. They just took part in a miracle. And that's who Jesus is. He can do everything by himself easily. But the light doesn't just care. The light is contagious. The light wants to spread. The light wants to give more of itself. The light wants to give of itself. Jesus, so Jesus, I love this. He had them fill the jars. Then he had them carry those heavy jars to the master of the banquet. You can imagine. I don't know if they saw that the, wa the water had turned to wine, but you can imagine, like, oh, my goodness. Like, what the suspense of carrying this, this jar to the master of the banquet to see what happens. Can you imagine? knowing the predicament this family was in. As your servant, you know they're out of wine. And you know if this leaks and this spreads, this family is done for. Only to know that Jesus changed the entire trajectory of their future. To, but then to know this, that Jesus didn't just save the dignity of this family, Jesus let you and I be a part of it, that we got to be a part of the miracle. Jesus wants his servants 
to be part of preserving the dignity of their neighbor. Jesus wants his servants to be part of helping others to be okay with not having or being enough. He wants us to be able to tell our neighbor, hey, you don't got it? Guess what? It's cool because Jesus does. Sometimes we ask each other for like a dollar, right? Like, man, I ain't got it. I'm sorry. You know what? It's okay. Someone's got us covered. Jesus wants his servants to be a part of showing others that he is the light. Do we believe, brothers and sisters, that Jesus wants us to be part of his work of changing lives? Or do you believe he just wants us to be bystanders? That we just come here every Sunday to sit and that's it. Or do we believe that he wants something more fulfilling for each of us? Do we believe that the light is contagious? You know, a few months ago, I shared about how Trini McGlowan, one of our awesome young professionals, she had on her heart to invite some people to church while she was shopping at a grocery store. Recently, Jason Roberts, who's also one of our awesome young professionals, was at the grocery store with Davion. And they decided, hey, you know what, Let's, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to invite somebody out while I'm here. And they, they, and they invited out a young man, and as they had a conversation with him, they found out he worked at the same hospital with who else? Trini McGlowan. <laughs> But when Davion told me that story, I was like, man, I think this is how Jesus wants it to be. Yeah. That everybody just, just trusts Jesus a little yeah. bit. That, man, wherever I go, I can be a light. I can be a part of a miracle. And, yeah, I'm not the miracle worker, but I can carry a jar. I can fill up some water and see what God does with it. Like, I don't know. What's he going to do with this water? I don't know. I, I, we, don't, we, we will never know the scientific ways that Jesus did that miracle. It's beyond us, but what we do know is we can fill up a jar with some water and see what he does. How can you play your part moving forward? How can you take a jar full of water to the master of the banquet and see what Jesus does with it? I love what Sean Pringle shared for his communion. He was like, man, how can I be a light? How can you be a light? How can you be an encouragement? How can you give, how can you share how can you live out scripture to somebody else this week, amen? Because Jesus can do something with it. Because Jesus does care. He cares so much that we're going to read about here. We'll see how much he cares about. Let's go to verse 13. And so we're going to move from one major Jewish event to another. This is going to be Passover, verse 13. It says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, Sheep and doves and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords. So you just got to stop and read that. Jesus made a whip out of cords. And drove all from all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remember that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. And Jesus responded to him. The Jews responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple had, he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. The light is contagious, but the light is also concerned. The light is concerned. So we go over to the Passover. And in this case, right, the temple courts, that was where not just the Jews could go and worship God, but the Gentiles. The further you went to the temple complex, the Gentiles could not go there. So the temple courts are where God, he said, God in his design said, this is where anybody, you don't have to be a Jew, but... They, here, you can sit and worship me. You can learn about me. 
I don't care where you're from. You can learn what it means to be child of Israel in these courts. So Jesus is angry because these people, if you were in this court, you were seeking God. You were trying to figure out who is this God of Israel. I've heard of these other gods. From, I'm from Mesopotamia. I'm from Phoenicia. I'm Greek. But I want to learn about what I believe is the true God. And you go there and you cannot learn about this God because it's totally overcrowded with merchants who are taking advantage of the Jewish sacrificial system. They, felt, they believe they can make a quick buck out of people having to buy animals for sacrifices. And so this is why Jesus is angry because he's like, this is not what the temple's for. And so he flips over tables. He scatters coins. He drives out the money lenders, the vendors, because there was no room for people to worship the God they were trying to know. He was concerned about the faith of the people. Do you believe Jesus is concerned about your faith, about your spirituality? He was so concerned, he took time to make a whip. And then he drove everyone out. To the, the fact that he made a whip implies that Jesus did not fly off the handle in a fit of rage. Making a whip implies a sustained concern for whatever it is you're concerned about. Because it wasn't just this fleeting like, ah! It was like, man, I cannot believe they're doing this. Jesus was a man of peace. You can imagine. I mean, at some point he cooled off. <laughs> but he made a whip. Jesus, Jesus is not temporarily concerned about you and I. His concern for us doesn't ebb and flow. He has a concern for us that doesn't lose steam after a few days. Our souls are always on his heart. And his, his concern for us isn't just sustained. It's strong. It's so strong that with that whip, he makes room again in God's house so that the Gentiles and Jews could both pray in peace. Do we believe that Jesus clears out temples for us to be close to him? That Jesus fights for us? That he clears out, that he, he stands up to the bullies for us? That he, he, he takes on the people taking advantage of us? That he stands up to Satan on our behalf? That's what Jesus does. Jesus was angry in this passage, not just because God was being disrespected, he was angry because the people were being robbed of a chance to be close to his father. Do we believe that we matter that much to Jesus? Do we believe that Jesus gets angry thinking about us trapped in our sin? You think you get angry. You think we get frustrated. We can't overcome stuff. Think about how Jesus feels. And not because he's frustrated with us but because he's protective of us, and he's protective of our faith. In this life, we all get to fight for something. We get to fight for what Jesus fought for, or we can fight for what we want. And we can, we can just be on a cycle of fighting for what we want, and it never fulfills us. But I believe when we fight for what Jesus fought for, we may not always get what we want, but we'll actually be more fulfilled in the process. Now think about Shannon and Susan Sylvie. Life has not always been easy for them. Shannon's always got something going on with his back. Dad's fighting cancer. But when I think of people just happy to be in the kingdom, it's Shannon and Susan. That's why we asked them to leave one of our family groups, because they just love opening up their home. So people can just feel God's love over there. To me, I remember going as a young Christian, Going to Shannon's backyard was like the temple courts. I'm, I'm learning about God because God gives me barbecue. <laughs> but they've let so many people stay at their place just to get on their feet. They had so many college students over there. Just They, just, they want college students to feel at home. They fight for what Jesus fought for. And I think they're more fulfilled than people who just fight for what they want all the time. Anybody can be like Shannon and Susan. Anybody can have someone over for a meal or take someone out for a meal and just let them know someone's got their back. Anybody be, can be concerned about what Jesus is concerned about and be fulfilled like Jesus was. And as we fight for what Jesus fought for, we, 
we start to see for ourselves why he fought, and that was he was consumed. The light is concerned, and the light is consumed. The light is consumed with us. The Greek word for consume communicates the idea that something has been totally devoured. Imagine a wolf eating its prey with no remains, bone and everything, gone. That is the type of consuming that Jesus undergoes when it comes to us. Bone and all, no remains, nothing. Jesus has been totally consumed. He was so concerned about people having access to the Father that it consumed him. It devoured him. He was willing to let his concern for us kill him. Of course, right, he, he, he overturns tables and he gets into a fight with the wrong people, essentially, right? I don't know if you've ever seen a table flip over, but it is a dramatic. Well, my campus minister one time, we were having a Devo, and I think he planted a, a plastic table in front of him. And he just flipped it over on purpose. Everybody was like, whoa, what is, what's happening? I remember being like, whoa, I can't imagine what that was like with an actual table. A plastic table flipped over quickly. Was a scene. I was like, calm down, bro. Are you actually mad? He wasn't mad. But yeah, I think it was for just the idea that it was dramatic. People would have saw. And it would, people would have been like, that's a marked man. We got we to gotta, we gotta do something with that guy. Jesus was willing to risk it. We see at the end of this that he prophesies about where this is all going to end for him. He alludes to the fact that his body is the temple. His body will be destroyed. His body will be consumed. Only three days later, it's going to be resurrected. But this is what it's all leading up to. Jesus, his love for us, consumes him to the, for, for the sake of our own salvation. The light allows himself to be snuffed out so we can have a chance to share the light. You know, it says, zeal for my father's house will consume me, right? That's what the prophecy says. Zeal, it defined, is a great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause. Jesus' zeal, his pursuit of loving his father, loving his people, it killed him. It took everything he had. Jesus' love for you, for me, it consumed him. It took everything out of him. I I just think we should kind of think about that. How do we leave here in light of that, feeling like business as usual? Someone's love for you consume them. You know how I think we can leave here? Just kind of like, okay, well, I'm going back to my life. I believe we can do that because our whole life, we haven't been trained to be consumed. We've been trained to consume. We've been trained to consume. Even the modern church, the modern Christianity has been trained to consume. It's not about how we respond to the cross, but we, what we can get and take from the cross. We are trained and programmed to consume. Why is Amazon such a powerful company? Because Amazon makes it really, really easy to consume. And look, I got no problem with Amazon. I'll probably get on it at some point this week. <laughs> and yet, the more we consume, the more we think we get what we want, the less content we've actually become as a society. We think, oh, I, I, we, if I get what I want, is everything in my life is going to be fulfilled. Our mental health has suffered, but what's really suffered is our spiritual health. There are incredible amounts of social study that has been done on the fact that happiness, they say, researchers say it caps out at about 75 grand a year. The, more, the, the moment you stop making more, it's like, it's, it's, it's a law of diminishing returns. So everyone that thinks you're, if you, oh, if I get, if I start making six figures and I become a millionaire, I'd be happy. S- secular studies say, no, you're not. Welcome to the rat race. You, you are not actually happier. More money, more problems. The light reminds us that we don't actually find our purpose in getting what we want. 
we become and live out who God has created us to be by giving of ourselves. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And his life was a life that gave and gave and gave. He was consumed yet was full of compassion. And every Sunday morning for the past few months, I got a chance to study the Bible with my buddy Jeff Marges and Sean Fugate, his buddy from work. And I've seen this phenomenon of Jesus play out. Jeff has grown more and more open about his life. And actually, his life has gotten harder, I think, as he's been more open and more real and transparent about his life, his struggles, his sin. But as his life has gotten harder and as he's been more transparent and real, He's become, in my opinion, more confident and faithful and honest about who he is as a man. He's a more genuine man than the man I met last year. And his life's gotten harder. What do you know? (laughs) Jeff has given more of himself, his heart, his failures, his successes. He's been hospitable towards us. He's opened up his home to us. And I've just seen God slowly change this man. The more Jeff has been consumed by God and given of himself, the more I see peace and compassion and faith and joy. And then I, love, I think about Sean Fugate. Sean Fugate is one of my spiritual heroes, man. Sean, just who he is, Sean gets to midweek at 7 at night on Wednesdays, and, and straight from making deliveries at FedEx. And he's, he's still got his FedEx uniform on, dead tired. I mean, I, he's been, this has been Sean's life for years. But Sean, he doesn't stop sharing about the gospel at work, which is why Jeff's here. But Sean leads our ushering team every morning. Sean is consumed by God's call in his life. He never has stopped giving. I've known this man now for 15 years. That man is one of the most compassionate compassionate people I know. His compassion is battle-tested. But he's never stopped loving God or people or the lost. If you know Sean, you know I ain't lying. Like, we all need more of whatever Sean got going on with him and Jesus. Like, I, I don't know what, he, what Sean does. I don't know what kind of prayers he prays. But, Sean, you, it's like, man, he, he's gone through life, and he's peaceful. Point being, Sean's never been here. I, I, that guy's never been here to consume. Sean's been here to give. He doesn't come here just sitting here like, what, what can I get from this time? That's never been Sean. And because of that, nothing shakes his faith. This week, how can you and I give to somebody else for the sake of Jesus? How can we be consumed and train ourselves to be less of being consumers? How can we be generous with the word of God? How can we be generous with our time, our money, our hospitality? The light has arrived. The light is here. It's been here. So however you choose to imitate the light, let's remember that first. We are imitating a light that cares. Jesus cares enough to stop and have fun and enjoy life, but also to intervene and do miracles. He cares, and therefore he is contagious. Jesus wants us to be a part of miracles. He's also concerned. He's concerned that Satan wants to crowd our hearts with a billion worries and a billion possessions. And finally, Jesus is consumed by his love for us. In light of that, let's allow ourselves to be consumed by our love for him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Hello, everyone. My name is Jason, and I get the chance to respond to the sermon. And so where do I even begin? That was, there's a lot to take in, but at least something that I can take out of it is just starting over with the whole uh, wedding uh, scene here. You know, I can't imagine what was going through the, uh, the wedding master's head about uh, losing all that wine or like not even having enough wine, all the shame that would come from it. And of course, I've, when I've taken it and applying it to my own life, it's like, man, if I run out of the things, you know, I'm, I'm a leader. I have to give a lot of energy to so much people if I run out of that what do I do? I'm probably going to try to bring it all together myself. Am I, am I going to go try to, like, I don't know, practically fix the stuff that I've found myself in? But instead, like, Jesus is there. He's at the party. 
Like, why don't I reach out to him? But, and so it just takes that bit of humility to step out and say, hey, I need help. But on the flip side, too, when people are humble, when they admit that there is something going on, uh, those moments when they reach out to ask someone to pray for them or reach out to get help, that is where we get a chance to be a part of the miracle. This is where, you know, the, uh, when, when Jesus uh, asked the servants to go get the jugs to bring it over, that's where we get to be a part of a transformation here. When someone comes in and asks for prayer or when someone comes in to have a deep conversation, that is a moment that we get to be a part of the transformation that Jesus wants to happen in that person. And so I was just thinking there, and I wanted to leave it off with something open. It's like, if the light is contagious in this moment, like we're getting to be a part of it, like Jesus is consumed to help everyone get grow close to God, to get a chance to worship him. I believe these moments right here should consume us to uh, bring everyone closer to God. And so that's what I really wanted to share about a sermon. Great sermon, Janice. You really, you really did a great job on it. And so uh, with that, we'll have uh, one final song, and I'll bring us up into prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this sermon, Lord. Just so many points, so much to think about. But ultimately, it's just it's amazing how this all leads back to you, that everything that we go through, the times that we struggle, the times that we think we have it all together, that Jesus is there, and he's just waiting for us to admit that, uh, man, we're struggling. But when you're there, Lord, you're ready to step out. You're ready to step into the action to bring us closer to you. And, you're, and you always want to use us to help it, Lord, uh, uh, help those people, Lord. And so I thank you that, man, we get to serve with you and that we get to build that zeal, zeal that you had in the temple courts when people were just wanting to worship there. And Lord, I thank you that, man, we, we get the chance to be with you. We get the chance to serve with you. And I just pray for all those moments. I pray for the challenges that we can go out and find those people to help. I pray this all in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, one quick announcement. Uh, we have, a, as mentioned earlier, we have our Marriage Night Out coming up February 10th. If you are married, one, and are planning to go and would like to register today, you can register in the back after service with Hazel. So she'll have a little computer set up and you can get signed up. So just wanted to make that plug.